In this video, we will cover the one sample t-test, when to use it, how to calculate it, what each part of the formula means, and we will run through a worked example step by step to show it in action. Now you'll remember, in the last video, we spoke about our friend, or I guess more accurately, our former friend, Honest Pete, and we discussed hypothesis tests in general, the logic behind them, what you need to set them up, and of course, we spoke about what really drives them, the infamous P value. Now, at the end of that video, we put ourselves in the shoes of an NBA basketball coach. They had four key scenarios to investigate, each of which was tied to a question that would help us as coach make an informed decision about our team. In this video, we are going to be focusing on this scenario here and looking to assess the question, is the mean vertical leap, so in other words, how high a player can jump off the ground, is the mean vertical leap of our team different, higher or lower than the mean vertical leap of all players in the NBA? To investigate this question, since we are comparing one sample, so the players in our team, to the full population from which they come, in other words, all players in the NBA, the appropriate test is the one sample t-test. Now, since we can't really ask whether the mean vertical leap of our team is different, different or higher or lower all at the same time, they are essentially three different questions, we are going to instead focus on the question, is the mean vertical leap of our team lower than the mean vertical leap of all players in the NBA? Because this is really the question keeping us awake at night as coach of the team. We will come back to the idea of the vertical leap being different later in the video because there is an important distinction to know about. But for now, the question on screen is what we are investigating. So as we discussed in the last video, every time we implement a hypothesis test, before we run the test itself, before we look at any numbers, we must first specify our null hypothesis, our alternate hypothesis, and our acceptance criteria. And on screen, you can see the more or less template definitions for each of these that we discussed in that last video. In the case of our specific question around whether the mean vertical leap of our team is lower than the mean vertical leap of all players in the NBA, our null hypothesis hypothesis is going to be stating that there isn't evidence to support that it's lower. So let's put this in as our team's mean vertical leap is equal to the overall NBA mean vertical leap. In other words, there isn't any difference between the two. Our alternate hypothesis is essentially what we're testing for or what we're interested in. So here, that will be that our team's mean vertical leap is actually lower than the overall NBA mean vertical leap. For the acceptance criteria, well, we could put in whatever value we want, depending on how much confidence we want in our findings. For ease here, let's just put in the commonly used value of 0.05. So remember, this acceptance criteria value will act as the line in the sand around which we make our, for the lack of a a better word conclusion around which hypothesis we think is more likely. So let's do this. As the coach, we have had a look into the available statistics for the NBA and we've calculated that the mean vertical leap across all players is 71 centimeters. Now for our squad of 30 players, we run the same calculations and we get a mean vertical leap of 67 centimeters with a standard deviation of nine centimeters. While on the surface, it appears that our team is lagging behind on this specific metric. So 71 centimeters for all players and only 67 centimeters is for our players as coach. We want to understand if this is a robust conclusion to make or if the difference could potentially just be down to chance or to noise in the data. So let's do this. Let's put in place the one sample t-test and have a bit of a look. And to do this, we would need this formula here. Now, formulas are often a little bit scary at first. So like we always do, let's turn it into words. So X bar, that represents the sample mean. In our scenario here, the sample is our team. So this is the mean vertical leap for our players. That symbol over to the right, known as mu, that represents the population mean. So in our case here, the mean vertical leap for all players in the NBA. Below that, we have S. And this is the sample standard deviation. So the standard deviation for our squad of players. We also have n, or more specifically, the square root of n. And n is referring to the size of the sample. So the number of players in our squad. And all of this will result in us calculating t. 
which is the T statistic. And this is gonna tell us where on the T distribution, the difference in the two means lies, taking into account the variability within our sample. In other words, taking into account the standard deviation and the sample size that were present in the formula that we've just been looking at. But what does all this mean in practice? Well, if we did indeed calculate our T statistic using our formula, and if that resulting T statistic had a value that fell into the bottom 5% of the distribution, which you can see here in blue shading representing the area under the curve. And I'm specifically saying 5% here because we specified an acceptance criteria of 0.05. If our resulting T statistic meant we fell into that region, then we would start to doubt the validity of the null hypothesis, which was that there was no difference between the means of our team and the entire MBA in terms of the vertical leap. And thus we would become more comfortable with the alternate hypothesis that there is indeed a difference. Now, conversely, if we calculated the T statistic and it instead meant we fell into this area of the curve here, in other words, the other 95% of the area under the distribution curve, then this would be suggesting that the null hypothesis that there is no difference between the means is actually quite likely or quite plausible. And in this case, we would see no reason to reject that notion or more formally, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis and essentially conclude that any differences between the two means was just down to noise or down to random chance. Now, at this point, a question that you might have, and it's a very important question is, well, what T statistic value creates this split? In other words, what value is this line here representing? Let's talk about this as a bit of background. Since the question that we're asking for our specific test here, which remember is, is the mean vertical leap of our team lower than the mean vertical leap of all players in the NBA? Because we're asking if it is specifically lower, we are only concerned with one side of the distribution. In other words, we're only interested in one of the tails of the distribution, this one here on the left. Because of that, we are running a one-tailed, one-sample t-test. The other option would be a two-tailed, one-sample t-test. And that would be applicable if our question was instead, is the mean vertical leap of our team different? to the mean vertical leap of all players in the NBA. In that case, we would be interested in T statistics falling in the extreme areas on both tails of the distribution. And interestingly, you can see that in this case, our acceptance criteria of 0.05 would be split evenly between those two outer areas. Now, very quickly, just for completeness, if our specific question was, is the mean vertical leap of our team higher than the mean vertical leap of all players in the NBA. This would again be a one-tailed, one-sample t-test, but we would be interested in the right-hand side of the distribution. Back to our specific scenario. Our wondering was, what is this value that splits our distribution between 5% of the area and the other 95% of the area under the distribution curve? Well, because we are running a one-tailed t-test here, we can simply look this value up in a one-tailed t-distribution lookup table. To find our value known as the critical value, we first need the degrees of freedom for our test. And this is just equal to our sample size n, minus one. Since we have 30 players on our team, this will be 30 minus one or 29. The other bit of info we need is our acceptance criteria, which we set to 0.05. Where these two numbers cross, we find the critical value for our test. And you can see here, this has a value of 1.699. And this is what we wanted to know. It is this point here on our distribution the point that splits the area by our acceptance criteria of 0.05, giving 5% on one side and 95% on the other. Since we're interested in the left-hand side of the distribution, we take this as negative 1.699. And we can do this because a T distribution by definition is symmetrical. So that is all well and good, but let's talk about this in terms of actual application. Like we discussed earlier, if the T statistic that we calculate in our test falls beneath this value, so any value below negative 1.699, we are gonna reject the null hypothesis. We are gonna reject the idea that there is no difference between the means of our team and the entire NBA in terms of vertical leap. And thus we would become more comfortable with that alternate hypothesis, that there is indeed a significant or reliable difference. But why is this the case? Why would we reject the null hypothesis here? Well, what we are saying in this scenario is if 
the null hypothesis is true. In other words, if there is truly no difference between our team's average vertical leap and the NBA average vertical leap, we would expect to see a T statistic as extreme as the one that we've got less than 5% of the time. And just like with Honest Pete's coin in that last video, we start to say, well, if it's that unlikely to happen, or at least if it's less likely than our acceptance criteria, then maybe it's not actually the case. Now, conversely, if we ran our test using the formula and we obtained a t-statistic that was higher than negative 1.699, this will suggest to us that the null hypothesis that there is no difference between the means is actually quite plausible or quite likely to be true. Here, we're essentially saying if the null hypothesis was true, we would expect to see a t-statistic like this one at least 95% of the time. And because of that, we might say it seems quite likely that the null hypothesis is actually true. And in this case, we would see no reason to reject that notion, or more formally, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis and essentially conclude that any differences between the two means was down to noise or down to random chance. So enough theory now, which is it gonna be? Let's do this, let's actually run our t-test formula, get the resulting t-statistic and find out our results. So back to our formula, and let's just rewrite it a little bit like this, just to make it a little bit easier to follow. So let's start inputting everything into the formula from our data on the left. Firstly, we have our sample mean of 67 centimeters. We also need the population mean. There we go, so 71 centimeters. Next, let's put in our sample standard deviation of nine centimeters. And finally, we just need the square root of our sample size, which was 30, and the square root of 30 is 5.48. Now, on the top there, 67 minus 71 is negative four. And on the bottom, we have nine over 5.48, which I can tell you equals 1.642. So let's do this. Our T statistic will be the result of negative four divided by 1.642. And that gives a value of negative 2.434. If we head back to our distribution, we see that this T statistic value would fall here at a point outside our critical value of 1.699. And because of this, we reject the null hypothesis. We reject the notion that the means of the two groups, so the mean vertical leap for our team and the mean vertical leap for the entire NBA, we reject the idea that they are actually the same. And in doing this, we tend our belief more toward the idea that the mean vertical leap for our team is actually significantly lower than that of the entire NBA. And as coach, we are thrilled to have successfully applied this one sample t-test and pieced this all together. But perhaps we are less thrilled about our players' jumping abilities. But that in itself is powerful. Even though it's not the result, perhaps we wanted to see as coach, it gives us some confidence about what to do next. It gives us some confidence in whatever decision we make to remedy this. And that is why this is such a powerful concept in business too. It helps us justify our decisions. It helps provide us or our stakeholders some confidence around the actions that we take. So there you go. That is the one sample t-test, a very, very powerful concept to know. To summarize, this is a test used when we're comparing a single sample from the population with the entire population that the sample came from. When we just want to know if the sample means are different, we would use a two-tailed test. If we want to know whether the sample mean is higher or lower than the population mean, like in our case here, then we would use a one tailed test. In the next video, we are going to build on all of this. So instead of comparing our team's mean to the overall NBA, we will be comparing our team to our rival team. I cannot wait for this. This is going to be really interesting and really powerful. So I will see you there.